We have our 10 Best Picture nominees. Today, I'm going to rank them because that's what we do here. What's up, Flick fans? Welcome back to the channel. Let's talk about these 10 movies, man. 10 movies that I thought would get nominated, and they were, but how would I personally rank them? I know the title says best, but it's really favorites, but you know, the algorithm. I won't lie to you, it's a pretty good group of nominees. We've seen way worse recently, uh, but I like the variety here, the different genres. Would I have put Iron Claw, Spider-Verse, Air in there? You know I would have, but you can't, you can't do it now, it's too late. Of course, if you're here and you like these types of videos, drop that like down below. If you do, we may be doing an Oscar predictions video this week. If you don't, well, I'll retire. Let's start with some honorable mentions, and there are none because there's only 10. That's the joke. Congratulations. Once again, congratulations. This bottom tier for me, these are films that I would not have considered for best picture. Now, that doesn't mean they're bad, but the first movie we're gonna talk about, I believe is okay, it's fine, it's serviceable, and most of the other movies I really like, but for me, Maestro is one that has all of the makings, all of the, the, the ingredients you need for a Best Picture nominated movie. Visually, it works really well. Beautiful film to look at, aesthetically it works, the atmosphere is great, uh, the music is obviously good, it's a movie based in and around music and that's going to work, the sound design, all of these technical elements, Bradley Cooper knows how to bring those to screen and Bradley Cooper gives a great performance. I know he's getting heckled online, and yeah, there, there's some things, right? But for the most part, this is an unrecognizable performance from Bradley Cooper. You can't deny that. He's fantastic in the film, so I don't want to look at this and say, well, he doesn't deserve it, and Carrie Mulligan doesn't deserve it. No, it's just the movie as the whole, and really for me, it is the story. The story is what I wasn't fully invested in. The pacing kind of right beside that, I just... I found this film to be a bit slower, which is fine, but its focus is in a place that I didn't really, I wasn't really excited about as I was watching it. It's more so about, or focused on, the romance between this iconic figure based on a true story, obviously, and uh, that spark between these two. The chemistry on screen is spectacular, but there are parts of his life within the confines of this romance that they don't even really explore. So in that way, it feels surface level, but the movie itself is about that. Meanwhile, you have all of this really interesting stuff happening with his music in the background, and we don't really get to see that come to fruition until the end of the movie, and that gives us one of the best scenes in the entire film, when he's actually being a composer that was magical, it was incredible, and the movie really started to bring me back in by the end. But I wasn't really that into it in the first two acts, and because of that, it didn't have my investment. Again, it's not a bad film, it's fine, but it definitely, I mean, I didn't have to think about this, comes in at the bottom of this list and I would have put multiple movies in over it. The Iron Claw is better than this. Wow! Hey Barbie. I guess I wouldn't put Barbie on the exact same tier as Maestro. I think this is a significantly better experience and just flat out a better movie than Maestro, even though it doesn't look as Oscar Beatty as Maestro does. When I first heard about this, well, way back in the day when they were considering casting other people, I'm like, this is gonna be a disaster. But then you hear about Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie and it all comes together and creates for a really fun and entertaining comedic experience. I think this is a really good comedy. I believe this is a movie with a message that does come across in a solid way. I found the screenplay, and it's funny because everybody's talking about the screenplay and it got nominated over Gerwig's direction. I would flip it. I'd do the opposite here because I found the screenplay to be the weakest part of the film, whereas I found Greta's direction to be what uplifted the movie. Her direction, the performances, Gosling and, and Robbie, the two standouts for me were fantastic. Ferrero was good. It gives one big giant monologue and you're like, oh, that's what well, got nominated, or she got nominated, and that's fine. She was really good in the film, but I don't see this as a movie that has all of the pieces coming together perfectly and fluidly like some of these other nominees do. When they're in Barbie Land, it's hilarious. But some of the best 30 minutes of a movie that I saw in 2023. When they go outside of Barbie Land, the movie starts to lose steam just a little bit and loses its way and doesn't feel as cohesive 
for me. And there are parts of what it tries to do that don't entirely mix with what they do. And then they go back to Barbie land at the end and Will Ferrell's group. They're there for some reason. There's just, just some things about it. And I'm like, this is good. It's entertaining. I'm enjoying it. But I didn't really see it as an Oscar player, even though I knew it was going to get nominated for Best Picture. So again, this isn't a negative for Barbie. Barbie is a really good movie. It was in my top half, top 30-ish movies of last year. So obviously, I really enjoyed it. But again, when you're talking about Best Picture, you're talking about the best of the best. I would not put it in there. But this is a really good group of nominees this year. What can I say? Are you sure about that? Auch Gemüse, bisschen Kräuter, auch Rosmarin, hier ist rote Beete. The Zone of Interest, directed by Jonathan Glazer. This is one of those films that I feel like a lot of people are going to walk into it and walk out silenced and stunned because they didn't know what they were in for. Others, and I, I noticed this at a couple of screenings, people walking out and saying, that was boring, it's not the movie I expected, and uh, they're going to walk out not enjoying it because, you know, it's a Best Picture nominee. Let's see what the hype is about. Oh, that's what it is. Well, and that's fine. I believe The Zone of Interest is a haunting and horrifying look at, well, evil in its finest form, and, you know, this family living next to this concentration camp, living so peacefully, and uh, there is happiness that exudes from our characters. Don't worry, I'm not going to spoil it. I know a lot of people haven't seen it, uh, but there's happiness that exudes from our characters as they are right next to this horror and these traumatic events happening that are just, I mean, it's basically just background noise as you're watching things happen on screen. And those things happening on screen, I can see how some will watch this and not be completely on board or entranced by what's not the plot, but what is being perceived as the plot itself. And that's understandable. I do believe the zone of interest is conceptually something that could have worked just as well as short form content, as a shorter movie. I mean, this could have been Henry Sugar length, 45 minutes long, and I would have said that that makes a lot more sense. I do believe the film is too long, but what it's saying and what it's going for, what it's trying to do, you walk away with that message, and especially the way the film wraps up, which... I didn't expect it all. When it cut, I'm like, oh, this, oh, what are they, that's what they're doing? And that's when I really, and I was on board throughout because it's just this really eerie, I know it got nominated for sound, deservedly so, but you get that sound design all throughout that's just so haunting. But once we get that end, I sat back and I said, oh, that's what they were, that's what they were trying to do. And they nailed it. You may wonder why the zone of interest isn't higher on my list. It's essentially just these other films are great. This movie is also great, and I'm glad it got a best picture. It's not my top 10 of the year, but I'm glad it got in. Yo, Sharonda, girl, you be pregnant again? If I is, Ray Ray is gonna be a real father this time around. American Fiction, in a year where a lot of the best picture nominees are just great, unfortunately, it doesn't crack that top portion of my list because it's just surrounded by greatness. And American fiction is a great experience from start to finish, and a lot of it revolves around, obviously, Court Jefferson, but Jeffrey Wright. This may be the best performance of his career, and that's a long, uh, impressive career. I can also talk about Issa Rae, really good in this movie, Sterling K. Brown, and... You know, the entire plot thread with writing this book, it being a joke, people taking it seriously, handling race in such a, a slightly hilarious but also really important way. This movie, what it has to say, it's kind of obvious, but it's given to us in a, a subtle and kind of distinct way. That's what I really appreciate about it. And it's doing great with nominations and award wins and all of these things. So it's kind of a sneaky-ish best picture player for me, even though we all know that's probably going to Oppenheimer. But American Fiction was a really fun watch. Entertaining. I didn't love the ending. I wasn't super pumped about the way that it went out. I get it, sure, but I wasn't hooked like I wanted to be. And as much as I emotionally connected to his story beyond just the book, the story with his mother, the story with his family, that was great. It was beautiful. It was really beautiful. Again, funny, beautiful. Some tragic things happen in this film. It's handled in a humorous way. I really liked what this movie was doing all throughout up until the end, which I, I wasn't the biggest fan of, but American Fiction is a film that is important, 
topical, but also handled in a creative way. The script is great. So I'm glad it made the best picture 10. Didn't make my personal 10, but I'm happy it's in there. You sure about that? This is Bella. Bye, bye. Bella, this is Mr. McCandles. Austin, poor things isn't in your top three. What are you doing, man? Look, I love Yorgos Lanthimos uh, for the most part. Poor Things is one of the most atmospheric and aesthetically pleasing movies I saw all year. The performances are outstanding. Emma Stone, she gonna get it. The award, she's gonna get the award. And I really liked what I saw out of her. Okay, that, this, I'm just making it sound weird now. T -t Today, Junior? She's great in the film. Yeah, people are complaining there's a lot of sex in this movie. That's fine, but I believe a lot of it was integral for her character in the movie. And... There are questions surrounding the morality of certain things, but I didn't necessarily see it in that negative light that some people are seeing it. I saw this as a movie that is a play on Frankenstein, but also one that knows its characters, one that has fun in this world that they're living in. Yorgos created something atmospherically, and the production design in this movie... It knocks it out of the freaking park. So, yeah, the technicals is what's getting me all fuzzy inside. But when you look at the performances, I mean, the main three, obviously, Defoe, Ruffalo, and Stone, fantastic. But some others that also add a lot. My issues come more with, you know, introducing something in the third act that could have been introduced sooner and maybe, you know, taking out a, a piece of that second act that didn't feel as integral to the plot. If they would have done those things, this could have been in my top ten of the year. But... Character-wise, humor-wise, I think the sense of humor that this movie has is excellent. And just the authenticity. Just hooked from the beginning in one of my favorite scenes of the year, Ruffalo and Stone dancing together. Uh, the quirkiness, the awkwardness. I loved it. I loved everything about that. Uh, the film itself, once again, it's just, it's just a list of great movies. What do you want me to do? I'm sorry. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. I need you to be precise. Tell me everything. Yes. <clears throat> What happens when a brilliant idea, a, a masterful screenplay comes together with some of the best performances of the year? That is Anatomy of a Fall. I saw this trailer and I was riveted. I said, I want to see this right away. And while it didn't end up being in my top 10 of the year, or it wasn't, you know, one of those that blew me away like an Oppenheimer or some other films that we'll talk about, I believe Anatomy of a Fall is a masterful screenplay. I hope it wins screenplay at the Oscars, and I just love the dialogue in this film. You know, Sandra Hewler's character, and she is suspected to be her husband's murderer, and uh, there is a dilemma, a question that you're getting all throughout the film. It's, did, did she really do it? And we have to see this court case play out, and this is basically a courtroom drama, uh, but it's very different from the courtroom dramas that we get in America, the way they go about the case, and the way the evidence is presented, and some of the people involved. Uh, but I come back to some of these just masterfully written scenes where we're, we're hearing and seeing things that apparently happened during the incident and then did happen during the incident and the questions consistently being posed. But, you know, as the movie progresses, you start to kind of lean one way or the other. And I had my mind made up. I'm not going to say anything because it's kind of a spoiler. I had my mind made up at the end of the movie whether she did it or not. And that's the beautiful thing about this film is the way everything is presented. You are in it along with everybody else. Now, I do believe there are some slower moments in Anatomy of a Fall that didn't have me fully invested. I don't really chalk that up to the screenplay, more so the pacing, more so the way it came together, uh, but that's my only major knock on the movie that is otherwise just a really beautifully written movie. Hewler is fantastic. Maybe some other performances that should have been considered, but all in all, I'm glad Anatomy of a Fall, once again, I'm glad it got in, and watching it a second time to prepare for this list really did it wonders. I'm glad I got around to that. The Osage took their name from Missouri and Osage Rivers. All right, Mart Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon. This is one, and you know, people are getting on to Marty, and they're like, why did he get nominated for Best Director over Greta Gerwig? I get it. It's, it's the same thing with Leo. It's like he gives performance after performance after performance and doesn't get nominated this year. It's like people are sick of greatness. And the same thing with Marty. He directs a movie that gets praise across the board, and then by the time you get to the end of the year, people are like, ah, I didn't deserve all of the accolades. And 
Yeah, it probably did. I mean, look, it's a great movie. It's a three and a half hour epic. Is it too long? Right? That's the constant thing. Lately, that's been the thing with Marty movies. It's like, yeah, they don't they don't need to be that long. And I agree. I don't think Killers of the Flower Moon needed to be three hours and 30 minutes. That's an easy complaint, but there were other three-hour movies in 2023 that I felt were the perfect length. So it really all comes down to how you handle it. Pacing was an issue. Okay, I get that. But beyond the pacing of Killers of the Flower Moon and the length, it doesn't need to be that long, does it? Sometimes short's the way to go, right? That's what she said. I don't know where that came from. I'm sorry. This is an important movie. What's being portrayed here and given to us revolving around the Osage and the travesty of the entire situation, but the evil that is portrayed through uh, De Niro's performance, uh, what we get from Leonardo DiCaprio is spectacular. He should have gotten a nomination. I can see the screenplay being snubbed because of how much there is jam-packed into it. And there's some controversy going on with who actually wrote the script and who did the treatment, blah, blah, blah. But So I can see that. I wasn't super upset with that snub, if you will. That being said, the direction is fantastic. The look and feel of the movie, the score, uh, the way that it just continues to impact you until the very end. And then the ending, which a lot of people had an issue with, the more I thought about it, the more I kind of got what Marty was going for. And Marty cast himself in the movie, so that's why it was cool. And I'll say it, I didn't hate the Brendan Fraser scene. It was, it was fine. Oh, boo-hoo. Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. There's a word in Korean, inyon. It means providence. Past lives, Celine's song. Greta Lee, I, look, I have raved about this movie since I first saw it. I've watched it uh, two times now. And the second time for me really cemented the subtleties, but the emotional impact that it gave to me. This is definitely a movie that you watch, you know, past certain points in your life and appreciate more. I feel as if I would have watched this when I was 16 or 17. I probably wouldn't have liked it all that much because I haven't had experiences that I can relate to the situation between our, our two, really three main characters in this movie. And it's two people that feel as if they were and maybe are soulmates and they reunite after being childhood friends. And there's this notion of, did I make a mistake? Did I, did I move on too quickly? And, and our main character, she has moved on. And I love really that dynamic between the three specifically the two when they all get together and the performances by all three. I think all three were worthy of a nomination, but this is just a really subtle film from Celine's song. It's easy to watch. It's beautiful. It's atmospheric. It's all of the things you want in an Oscar nominated movie, but it's just like a pure romance. It, it reminds me of the before trilogy in a way that feels so natural and the dialogue between the characters feels so natural. It's not the most upbeat and hilarious and entertaining watch ha ha that I've ever seen in my life but it didn't have to be it's a movie that knows what it is it, it does those things beautifully and man oh man this uh this makes you look at your own life and you're like man how did I get so either lucky or why did I make these mistakes and and the reflection that our characters are doing it almost transfers to you and it all comes back to that opening scene how uh, other people are perceiving our three characters man I, I love this movie I've talked about it a lot but this is the tier that starts great, you know, top 10 Austin films. Uh, Past Lives is just the beginning. Sir, I don't understand. That's glaringly apparent. I can't fail this class. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Mr. Coates. I truly believe that you can. I've been seeing some people put the holdovers lowered down on their list. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, you boys need to be talking to me about why you're doing that, because it ain't going to make a lot of sense, okay? I don't like Alexander Payne, okay? Okay, I, I get it. I really do get it, to be honest with you, but... um. But this is a movie that a lot of people worked really, really hard on. And it is obvious to me the passion that went into it by the director, but also by the writers and also by the cast and Paul Giamatti and Dominic Sesson, Divine Joy Randolph and everybody gives it their all. But they give it their all into this movie that could have been just a, a silly 80s wannabe, you know, Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller type of movie where it's got the funny funny, but then there's a little bit of heart in there as well. Okay. John Hughes, you are not. 
that's not really what happened. Now, it's not a pure John Hughes film, but it does feel like a classic 80s Christmas movie, but also a classic 80s comedy with this this level of heart that I did not expect whatsoever. But it's the dynamic between the characters, and I love a movie that gives you characters that you want to spend time with after it ends. Like, I could have went 30 more minutes just sitting in the, the truck with Paul or, or hanging out with Angus at school with his friends. Yeah, that probably would require a restraining order. That, that'd be weird. You're really weird. Or just in the lunchroom with Mary. I loved these characters so much. I love when they're together. I love when they're apart. I, I love all of the little adventures that they go on throughout the film. And I was having a really good time when it was a bunch of those boys and Paul just trying to do what he could to take care of them. But when it turns into the movie that it inevitably ends up being and this relationship starts and, you know, a man who sees so much potential in this kid and a kid who sees himself in this man. And that dynamic was just so beautiful. You can say it's a crowd pleaser. There's some really tough moments in this film. You could say it's a very cliche and we've seen it before. Yeah, we have seen it before, but when's the last time we saw a movie like this about the 70s that feels like it comes from the 80s? And I just, I can't remember the last time a film came together to make me feel this magical. And it's up there in my favorite Christmas movies of all time conversation. That's a hard thing to do after one watch, but I've seen it four times. This is in its own category. It is one of my favorite movies ever? Maybe. The Russians have a bomb. We're supposed to be years ahead of them, but... So what were you guys doing in Los Alamos? But nothing can stand in the way of Oppenheimer. Have you seen the Peter Griffin poster? <laughs> I hate you, doing. My name's J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oh my God. Who the hell cares? I feel like I don't have to say much. I have praised this from the beginning in my first review and then watching it again and then watching it again and then watching it one more time. And uh, did I watch it one more time after that? I believe I did. And then I watched it again and then I plan on seeing it again. And then when it re-releases in theaters... Benny Safdie, Kenneth Branagh, Rami Malek, Josh Hartnett, Florence Pugh, Matt Damon, uh, Josh Peck. Make it! RDJ, given the performance of a lifetime, Emily Blunt, she's so daggone good, people are forgetting about her, but hey, she's still got the Oscar nomination. And then... Killian Murphy's performance, which will go head to head with Paul Giamatti's performance, and I still don't know whose is better. My heart tells me Giamatti. Uh, my my analytical, uh, I don't know. That could also be Giamatti, but Killian Murphy is spec freaking tacular in this film, man. Everybody's great. This is one of those movies that I, I just go on YouTube and I type in, hey, let's watch this scene, this very specific scene. I don't think it's going to be on YouTube, and it always is. Because this movie's so good, there are 25, 30 standout scenes and sequences, and I watch it, and I listen to it, and I soak in the score, and I and then I ascend, and then I ascend. This is Nolan's, it's Nolan's masterpiece. Again, I'm not saying it's my favorite Nolan film yet, but it combines everything we've always loved about Nolan and gives us the best product we possibly could have gotten. Imagine anybody else trying to do Oppenheimer, trying to direct it, uh, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked. This is his best script ever. These are some of the best characters he's ever directed. Everything is great across the board. It's three hours that flies by. And a lot of people say the last 45 minutes is unnecessary. It did catch me off guard the first time I watched it. I'm like, yeah, everything wraps up and it just feels like a... Why do we need that? But now when I watch the movie, I look forward to what happens after because we get some of the best dialogue in the entire film and the way that it wraps up in the ending. He always crushes it with his endings. I don't, look, it's boring. What I'm saying is boring. What I'm doing is boring. I could rave about this all day. It deserves to win Best Picture. Will it? I hope so. No, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, there's my top 10. I talked long enough. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for watching. What is your... I mean, look, this doesn't work if you don't leave your top 10. And we're not going top 10 by uh, what I think will win Best Picture. That's a video for another day, possibly tomorrow on this channel. We're going by which movies I like the most. So that's that's what I'm doing. Thanks for watching. If you want to drop a like, great. Leave a comment, great. Come back to this channel. We'll do some Oscar predictions, great. I'll see you soon. see it that next time. I'd love to see it in 70 millimeter one more time. Uh, but I don't know. I think I've lost count on how many times I have watched it. Uh, my chair is getting stuck. 
And as I continue to rotate, there's a core that's being wrapped up. All right, we're going to have to go all back the other way. Go back the other way because the chair is being wrapped up by a cord. And I don't know exactly how this is going to... I, guess I probably messed it up. Let's see if we're still recording. Coming back around. Are we still recording? Oh, it looks like we are. Nice.